You are listening to Living the Clover Life. Hello and welcome to another episode of Living the Clover Life. My name is Nathaniel Ria and I'm the Director of Evangelization and Adult Faith Formation here at St. Malachi in Brownsburg. And I'm Father Sean Danda, the pastor at St. Malachi in Brownsburg. And today we're talking about the Eucharist. So, Father, would you start us off in prayer? I'd love to. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Father, we are so thankful that you have given us your Son, that he remains here present in every tabernacle around the world. Help us to love and to adore him, to worship and praise him so much more for all the graces and blessings that he pours out in our lives. Grant all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we're talking about the Eucharist, Father, and uh, you know it, it's really exciting anytime you get to talk about the Eucharist because it is, of course, the the source of our faith. It's the summit of our faith. Mm-hmm. It's where everything comes from, and it's mm-hmm. also where we're heading. And I think as Catholics, sometimes today we take for granted that, like, oh yeah, you know, it's that that Catholic thing we do. Protestants don't do that, but what we do, but we don't necessarily know the roots. We don't know the grand and rich history of where this idea of Eucharist comes from. Just theologically and historically, but also in terms of the spirituality of the Eucharist. And I know you uh, have a lot of experience and and background in kind of the biblical roots of the Eucharist and what it means for uh, us as Catholics today to celebrate the Eucharist in this grand continuity between both our our spiritual forebears in the the Jewish tradition and in the early church. So um, yeah, as far as your kind of Go to uh, stories or verses or concepts in the Bible that kind of let us know what uh, what we should understand about the Eucharist. What would you say those are? The Bible from the beginning to the end is <laughs> all about the Eucharistic Lord and his love for us. Uh, in the garden, of course, the fall began with a bad meal. We took mm. from the tree uh, mm. to become gods ourselves under the illusion that, that that would be possible from the lie of the serpent. And then the, the Bible ends in the book of Revelation with the great marriage feast mm. of the Lamb, of the Lamb's Supper, as Scott Hahn will call it, and where God really pours his life in abundance into us where he divinizes and makes us into his other self uh, which is what he really wanted to do from the very beginning (laughs) and so peppered throughout scripture are all sorts of of sign symbols of events that eucharist uh that are eucharistic at its heart sacrifice and meal really coming together and a lot of us, our, our minds go right to the the story of the Exodus, right? And the la- the the supper where we we take the lamb. The lamb is sacrificed. Its blood is put on the doorposts. The doorposts that are bloodied. What does that remind us of? The cross. Our Lord's sacrifice at the cross as well. He is the Lamb of God that John points out as well throughout uh, Israel's time of worship as it develops, we see in the the temple worship how we have the bread of presence in the Holy of Holies, which only the priests could could eat. Uh, And of course, we have that beautiful entrance where David comes and he consumes of the bread of the presence, even though it was not lawful for him. And just that word itself, bread of the presence in the Holy of Holies. I mean, that sounds very Catholic in right. and of itself, doesn't it? It's it's pointing us to, to the Eucharist. Everything's like foreshadowing towards that. In fact, you, you find in Scripture in Leviticus how the, the morning and evening offerings, what were the Jews supposed to offer to the Lord? Well, it was some wine. It was like a little bread cake Mm. Mm. and it was a lamb. And all of these come together to be a sacrifice and they all point towards our understanding of the Eucharist as, as well. And then Jesus comes on the scene right. and he's born in Bethlehem. And what can you tell us about Bethlehem? You know, Bethlehem, I, I love, again, the, all the etymology of the words. In, in Hebrew, the word Bethlehem literally means house of bread. And in the Muslim tradition, in the Arabic tradition, 
the word Bethlehem means house of flesh. And so there you have this, this grand unity, both of them getting a part of it, right? But, but there's this, this unity in both of those things being true in that Christ himself, the bread of life, the flesh of God being present among his people. And where is the baby Jesus laid? In the manger in Bethlehem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And a manger, of course, is a feeding trough. It's yep. where the animals come to eat their hay and, and eat. And of course, it's a, again, it's, it's a sign that's showing us who is this savior. He is going to be a precious food for us, a very real food for us. In fact, Jesus's first miracle is at uh, the wedding feast at Cana. He's changing water into wine. Mm -hmm. Later on, he'll be turning wine into his precious blood. Yeah. The multiplication of the loaves given to, to feed the people. And later on uh, at the Last Supper, he's going to turn loaves of bread into his flesh. And it really comes to its, its high point, I think, in the Gospels at John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse. Right. In that teaching, this beautiful, it's the longest chapter uh, hmm. in, in John's gospel. And Jesus is very poignant. And he says it several times, reiterates it again and again. Unless you eat the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, you will have no life within you. Right. And that's hard for them to accept, right? It was. They, they kind of balk at him and they keep asking him, well, what do you mean here? And he just reiterates it. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life within you. And they're thinking, you know, there's got to be some symbol here. This is a metaphor. He's speaking an analogy. And he, he doesn't he doesn't clarify. Right. He says, nope, this is, this is what I mean. And then a bunch of them walk away, right? It's the only place in the Bible where we see people who actually leave Jesus as it says, and go back to their former way of life. Mm -hmm. And it's a very sad moment yeah. that they would give up on him because of this teaching. And he doesn't say, oh, don't go. Yeah. I, I was just kidding. Yeah. I really don't mean cannibalism here, yeah. which is probably what they were all thinking. And right. of course, Jewish laws would, would really make this repulsive right. to them. Right. Drinking blood and so on it would be very yeah. uh, uh, verboten. But then he turns to his apostles, right? And he says, are you going to leave too? Yeah. And he doesn't. of course, Simon Peter has that famous, Lord, do, where else where, will we go? And he, he really takes Jesus on, on faith that, that he's going to bring this about. He's serious about this. I need to accept this. And, and they do, of course. And, and that becomes kind of the high point of our faith that Jesus is giving us his very body, his very blood mm -hmm. in the Eucharist. At the Last Supper in particular, where he ordains his first apostles to mm -hmm. be the first bishops of the church who are right. going to then ordain bishops in every community that they find to be able to, to validly do this sacrament to make Jesus body, blood, soul and divinity present in the Eucharist. In fact, when you you read about uh, St. St. Justin the Martyr's mm -hmm. description of Christian worship. I mean, it sounds just like the mass right. uh, from every element, from the readings to the elements of bread, water, and wine being brought forward that the, the, the president of the assembly, the priest of the assembly says a particular prayer. Everybody assents with an amen. Uh, and that they really believe that Jesus was present from the very beginning. John, uh, Justin Martyr is writing in 150 AD, and mm -hmm. yeah. that is an essential belief that Christians have. It's all too easy for us to forget because it can become so commonplace right. in, uh, you know, that, that Jesus is present in every single tabernacle and every single Catholic church throughout the world. In Except, every single host, in yeah. every fragment of a host, and all the crumbs. That's why at Mass you see me being very diligent about cleaning the vessels and and consuming all the crumbs that are are left over and then the what is consecrated is taken back to the tabernacle to be reserved for our worship and adoration and for 
for being brought to the homebound for those who are not able to come as well. Right. And, and the care we take when we receive either on the tongue, which kind of takes care of it, or when one receives on the hand, making sure that every every piece of the Lord is consumed so that we, again, uh, have that, that deep and abiding respect for him. And I think one of the things we can also forget is that the greatest thing we can do as Catholics is worthily receive the Lord. Mm. And that that's, again, hard because it becomes so commonplace. I think St. Joseph is a great saint to, to pray to and to ask his intercession for in this particular area because, you know, he lived with the Virgin Mary. He lived with Jesus. Uh, it became every day for him. And so remaining sensitive to the profound reality of who Jesus is and the fact that he makes himself present to us viscerally, physically, spiritually, in every possible way in such a humble manner. And some, some of the great saints have said St. Joseph's house was like the first uh, perpetual adoration chapel <laughs> because you had Jesus physically present and Joseph just kneeling at the bedside of Jesus and, and oh, contemplating wow. our Lord uh, with the Blessed Virgin Mary right there as well. A beautiful, beautiful image. But you're so right to be able to to prepare our hearts to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. It's such an intimate act uh, to receive God into our bodies in a very yeah. physical, powerful, and real way that has very, very much spiritual effect. St. Paul warns us if we're not well disposed, we are, as he says, eating and drinking judgment and death upon ourselves. And so getting ourselves ready, having good reflection about what I'm about to do. Is there any sin that I, I need to confess in uh, the sacramental confession to clear every part of me so that the Lord can come and be Lord of my heart? Am I holding anything back from yeah. him? And do I believe that he is present? Like It's not just a cracker, right? It's not just a, a little wafer. I'm actually receiving him. And in order to receive well, we have to believe that. And if we believe that, if we believe that the lover of our souls is present here, desiring to be one with us, we have to be very uh, conscientious about how we approach him. That's why the church teaches if you're in a state of mortal sin, if you have, have told God with your actions that I know this thing is seriously wrong and I'm going to do it anyway, I don't really care what you teach Jesus, I don't really care uh, what your church says, I'm, I'm going to receive you anyway. Use and that lack of love uh, in that approach is is what makes it so problematic when we if, if we were to do that. And so again, as you say, examination of conscience, confession, settling into a, a disposition to receive him worthily is so, so, so. One of the things that we have to remember also is that if if we're to receive him worthily, we really, as you said, have to examine our conscience. Have we committed a mortal sin? Have we have we done something that is grave? that we know is wrong and that we've done anyway, right? That's about the most unloving thing you could do in a marriage, right? Mm -hmm. I know you don't want this to happen. I see that it's going to happen and you're not going to be happy and I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care what you think. That's the same as when we receive the Eucharist without uh, uh, confessing, seeking forgiveness about that. And we can't forget that when we come to Mass, it, it's not necessary that we receive Holy Communion. Our participation mm. is still there. It's higher, obviously, and we're, the church really envisions us to be able to receive Holy Communion, but it doesn't invalidate our Mass. And I know sometimes people feel that way. Well, if I don't receive Communion today, then I've somehow not done all I was supposed to do. Well, sometimes, sometimes it just happens that way. Uh, maybe we're not feeling well or where we ate too soon before, or again, yeah, I haven't been able to get to confession. I can still go and give my heart to the Lord in a special way uh, and then get ready. And the next time I go to mass, go to communion. And I think that's, that's another uh, really important point you raised there in that, you know, we're, we're called to fast physically uh, an hour before receiving the Eucharist, which is kind of hard to calculate exactly, but you know, if you stop eating half an hour before a weekend mass, right. um, which is about an hour long usually, you, you should be generally good. And that is really important because on the one hand, it's not just this sort of intellectual exercise. It's also a physical hungering for the real flesh, the, the true food that we will eat and never hunger again uh, in eternity. So that, that physical preparation washes over into the spiritual, into the contemplative, into making us uh, available and ready to receive the Lord worthily. 
And I know you have had, in particular, some very intimate encounters with our Lord in, in the Eucharist. Yeah, and I think sometimes people can say, oh my gosh, you guys are taking this so seriously. It's a cracker, y'all. Get over it. And it's not. He's there. He is present in body, blood, soul, and divinity in each host, in each fragment of each host, in each droplet of blood. Yeah, I've had some beautiful experiences of seeing Jesus' face in the Shroud of Turin on, on the Eucharist in adoration, sensing his presence very, very physically, very uh, palpably. I've seen um, dried blood on the Eucharist as well. And just it wasn't there a moment ago, and then it was there. Uh, Jesus gives us sometimes these little signs as reminders, like, I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, don't doubt. I'm here. And many people don't have those experiences and, and their reception and, and their experience of the Lord is just as valid. But Jesus is absolutely present. And sometimes it's even greater science he gives. Yeah. And it isn't uncommon, though, as well. I've, I've had parishioners who've told me that the, the host has kind of turned to a bloody substance in their mouth. Mm. And all of this reminds me of the many Eucharistic miracles that are out there that have happened uh, yeah. from the Middle Ages uh, that are documented up till today. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that should you encounter a Eucharistic miracle, like some people might say, oh man, that would be weird if, if, that, if that happened. The Lord knows what you need. The Lord knows uh, what you are, uh, uh, how you might receive him, how you might encounter him. And he's not going to cause you to encounter him in a way that you wouldn't be able to receive. Right. We don't have to be scared of that. He, the Lord knows what's best for us. Absolutely. And you know, you mentioned the, the Eucharistic miracles. There are some just amazing stories of the miraculous uh, uh, in the Eucharistic history of our church, all the way from the Middle Ages, all the way up until very recently, you know, approved Eucharistic miracles happening. Uh, as recently, I know as 2008, there's been one uh, that was uh, explored and, and researched by the Vatican and approved. And people can say, well, you know, they faked it. They, they, they took a little piece of meat and they put it in there. One of the most convincing ones is a story about how uh, Jesus became present in a host. And uh, so there, were, there was a spot of blood on the host and also turned part of the host into flesh. And so when it was assessed scientifically, what they found was that there was this merging of, of the, the muscle, the heart tissue. They found out, interesting that it was heart tissue, which is so beautiful because Jesus is sharing his heart with his people. But there was this merging between the, the substance of the bread and, and the flesh. They couldn't find or understand how the flesh and the bread were, were kind of linked together, like the substance transformed between bread and, and heart muscle, mm. which is just amazing. And... This is, this is even further uh, a sign. When they assessed the heart muscle, what they found was this is heart muscle from I think, the left ventricle of someone who has been tortured, someone who has had the most awful physiological things done to them to cause this certain uh, 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 chemical uh, presence to be there in that, and this certain uh, substructure in the, in the tissue to be present. So if you were trying to fake this, you would have to do something extremely grievous and torture someone and then find a way to take out that heart muscle while they were still alive, by the way, because it because it, it it's it's heart muscle that you can only sort of see this in a heart that's been traumatized that's alive. And then somehow merge it and make there be no distinction between the bread and the flesh in its transition. And so just amazing, amazing miracles that we see that with the Lord throughout the ages. But in modern times, we're able to look at them scientifically and see wow, there's just no explanation for this at all. And there are so many. I think we're going to put some links in the description for you to, to look at, especially uh, Blessed Carlo Acuta. He has systematized all of these, or as many as he could find anyway, yeah. miracles that are known to us, which is beautiful and wonderful and, and really increases your faith when you begin to explore them and see what's out there. But one of the most powerful things we can do is just go and spend time in his presence. Amen. 
is to, to go to Eucharistic adoration or just sit before Jesus in, in the uh, tabernacle. Yeah. Uh, some, of, some of the great ones have said it's like spiritual radiation. You're right. sitting in the Lord's presence and taking it in. You don't have to say anything. Um, I think it was St. John Vianney. He asked one of his parishioners, what are you doing when you're sitting in the church? And he said, well, he looks at me and I look at him. And what a beautiful mm explanation uh, of that and of course the apostles yeah they just spent time with jesus right yeah and in that in that transformation they became his church right yes. by spending time with him they became more fully what they were supposed to be and they were able to live out his mission for them once he's ascended into heaven through the power of the holy spirit but through the lessons that he taught them through the change that occurred in them because he taught them he instructed them and they spent time with him and you just think about the silent time they must have spent with him, either at night, sleeping, camped out, yeah. or walking someplace, or or just kind of just being in, in quiet with one another and looking at him and mm -hmm. just thinking, who is this? <laughs> this guy is something else. And the same is true for us when we spend time with Jesus. Uh, it really just increases our faith and helps us to be better prepared and ready to to meet him in this wonderful blessed gift that we have in the blessed sacrament. Well, if you can this week, I want to really challenge you, maybe find a, find a church, find a, a tabernacle where you can go and be in Jesus's presence, even if just for five minutes or a couple minutes even. It, it does wonders for the heart and for the soul. And so until next time, keep living the clover life. You've been listening to Living the Clover Life. For more information about St. Malachi Catholic Parish, check out our website at stmalachy.org. S-T-M-A-L-A-C-H-Y dot org.